We all have something that we're good at and we need to work at it. You can either go through life or grow through life. Your top of the top people learn just as much from winning as they do from losing. You only fail when the learning process stops. Obviously you have this acclaim in working with some of the most successful athletes to ever do what they do. Tom Brady, Michael Phelps, the list goes on and on. And I think immediately what people would feel is like, I'm not like those guys. And you make the argument, and matter of fact, you lay out really the science of this, the art and science of like, you do have this in you, you just don't know it and you need the guidance. And that's what you've really unlocked for us. So can you start off by talking about on the surface and maybe even a little bit deeper, what makes somebody like Tom Brady different? Well, if we, we, if we go straight to it, Humble and hungry. <laughs> Bruh, hungrier than the average person, but humble enough to be coachable. Wow. Coachability is the critical piece to the puzzle. Imagine trying to explain to a 19-year-old Tom Brady, uh, who's really convinced that the coaches don't like him, that they're not giving him the opportunities they're giving the other players. And him sharing that with me. And I'm listening carefully because that's what I do. I listened, I listened, and he vented and he it was he's emotional. And I share with Tom, I, I hear you, I feel your pain. Who gives a rat's ass <laughs> <laughs> about what the coaches think? What do you think? You want the coaches to believe in you and you don't believe in yourself, son. So until you believe in you, don't expect me to believe. Now, the good news is I'm crazy enough to believe anyway. And I believe that you're capable and qualified of transforming your mindset, transforming the way that you see this and take full responsibility for, if you're only getting three, three reps, those got to be the greatest reps that anybody's ever seen. And then they'll give you five. <laughs> and then and over time, uh, oh, look out. And that's how you transform. So yes, taking total responsibility. If, for example, if we use that same example, we look at Tom, and Tom wants to be a, a, a professional football player, and he's not even in the lineup. I say, you need to train as though you're going to be a professional football player. In fact, why don't we get football out of, out of the equation? I say, why don't you train like an Olympic athlete? That's a different mindset than I want to play football and I want to be in the NFL. Why don't you be one of the best athletes on the team? Why don't you change the way that you're approaching this? And it seems to have worked out a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> the results speak for themselves. You know, you teach this to the people you've worked with as well, that the obstacle is the way. You know, those adversities are actually great teachers and opportunities to see Difficulties is opportunities. You're going straight to uh, the daily stoic. <laughs> you understand the obstacle is the way. Uh, and there have been obstacles in our lives. I mean, the good news is we don't look like what we've been through. <laughs> True that. <laughs> you know, and so um, the things that I thought were just overwhelming and horrendous that happened in my life prepared me to work with others. It prepared me to be able to hear somebody going through stuff and not judge them. Somebody is tripping, dipping, and slipping and not just say, you tripping, dipping, and slipping. This is what's going on. This is what you can get out of it. And so one of the most important lessons in the book and one of the most important lessons I try to teach is you can either go through life or grow through life. <laughs> You can go through it or grow through it. And if you choose to grow from the obstacle, grow from the challenge, grow from the difficulty, if your mindset is to like, whatever's being delivered, I can go through it. And if you look carefully, uh, in, in one of the chapters talking about 100%, 100% of the time, I'm suggesting to people that they have an attitude where they give 100%, 100% of the time and have that as their default mode. Yeah. Well, every now and then somebody will be smart enough and say, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Nobody can do that. And I said, of course not. But if my mindset, if my mo, if my primary 
form of operating in my head is to try to give 100%. I no longer am coming off at 30%, 40%, 50%. If my mindset is to give 100% at the things I don't even like, Desmond Howard is a great example. Desmond Howard was ready to leave Michigan, and uh, we sat and chatted. And I shared with Desmond that, you know, uh, there must be a reason you're not starting and not playing because he came in. Most people don't know Desmond Howard was a running back in high school and was amazing. And he was switched over to wide receiver. But back in the day, in that period of time, if you didn't block in the Big Ten and you were a wide receiver, you're not getting on the field. Well, Desmond didn't block. (laughs) And he was struggling. And I explained to Desmond, you can leave Michigan, but who cares? You haven't done anything. And so you're going to go somewhere else with different colors. Guess what? They're going to treat you the same as we're going to treat you. But most importantly, Des, let's, let's look at it this way. If you want to leave, why don't you blow up and become extremely successful and have us beg you to stay? He said, huh? I said, so let's look at this 100%, 100% of the time. There are things you don't like to do. I need you to give 100% to the things you hate. Now, if you create a habit of giving 100% at the stuff you hate, what you going to do when you get to the stuff you love? Mm -hmm. You'll have a habit of trying to give 100%. Okay. Well, still, Greg, let me help you out. If my mindset, my default mode is 100%, 100% of the time, my worst day is going to be better than the average man's best day. That's a game changer, baby. Yeah. I love that about, about your work as well. Repeatedly throughout the book, you're talking about how so many people get in this habit of complaining that they're not getting an opportunity instead of focusing on being ready. Like, again, Tom was like six string. Right? And just yes, being ready, working on the things that he can work on, controlling the controllables. My man. Yes, sir. Because that because I can't control what the other what the coaches think, except by demonstrating and being consistent. So my ability to decide how I'm going to respond is different from reacting. So I have to learn to respond to what's going on around me. I can't control, I can, I can barely control my dog. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to control other people and what they think, I can't. What I can control is how I think. I can control how I feel. I can control that you are not going to have power over me. I can decide. And we're not talking about the extremes in the, in the traumatic uh, relationships where someone is being abused. We're talking about Outside of the outside of that realm, we're talking about my ability to decide that if I don't bend over, you can't ride me. <laughs> you know, I'm going to decide how I feel. Now, the most difficult lesson, Tom, Desmond, Sean, is when you say 100 percent, 100 percent of the time. You have to add the phrase win, lose or draw. Now, everybody here is the 100 percent. But they don't want to hear the win, or oh, they hear the win. <laughs> but they don't want to hear the lose or draw. So I'm going to give you a hundred. I want to be that guy. The, the the athletes, the executives, the people that I've worked with, I've got to teach them that even if you lose, your opponent is saying, "Dang, I hate that guy. I wish he was on our team." That's all I want. I want to win. I'm going to be mad if I don't win, but I'm going to get over it quickly because I know that I gave 100%. And the guy on the other side is talking about how in the heck did this come to pass? Who is this guy? I want him to be part of my program. That's what we want. Being relentless is having a mental focus and having a mental energy that is all about results. It's all about it's all about results. You know, it, it, and people, when you think about results, it could be in anything you do. It's this isn't just about you know, individuals always measure success, and if this person's relentless about how 
influence they how much influence they have on an individual, how much money they have. No, you have teachers that are totally relentless. You have bus drivers, you have individuals in everyday life. You know, you look at just these people that are sitting here putting the show together. Okay, being relentless is are the mics in place? You know, the gentleman stopped us earlier. No, we need to change that. Yeah. Paying attention to those little details matter. It's a relentless is a mindset. It's a habit that you create within yourself where you accept, you accept only perfection. You're never yeah. going to reach perfection. Okay. But knowing that that's what you're all knowing, that's what you're always chasing. And if you know that you're always going to chase that, it's going to make you better and better. And just paying attention to those little details, they can easily come on here. And if this wasn't, if they didn't care about their job and we didn't care about what we were doing here, you know, these, these little sound effects, little thing, majority of the people may not know, but you know, these people know. Yeah. All right. And that's not relentless. Being relentless is paying attention to every single detail so you can get that end result over and over again. And keeping that mental energy and keeping that mental focus, which nowadays is so, so hard to do, but it, it can be done. I mean, people yeah, are doing it absolutely. all the time. This concept of being relentless, I really feel that it's a competitive advantage today. Since so many people are distracted, there's so much that's pulling us in these different directions. If you can focus on that thing and execute, you're just putting yourself in an entire, entirely different universe. And it's really not even that difficult. It's just having the courage to kind of do it. It is, you know, there's no, there's no secrets out there. You know, I love these people that try to say, oh, you know, my eight secrets to success or so forth. We already, everyone knows what to do. I love how people come in and, you know, you got to, you got to outwork the other individual. You know, you got to get up early. You got to stay late. You got to make more phone calls. We all know that. We we already know. We already know that. And it's what you said. It's that me it's being able to take that relentless mental focus, block out those distractions and, and do what and do what you need to do. And, you know, be able to finish. You know, everybody can start something. Hmm. How many people do you have? you know, in the fitness industry or in entrepreneurship or whatever, everyone starts things. Mm -hmm. But how many people actually have the ability to finish something? Yeah. This brings us to a good segue with these three categories of, of people mm -hmm. that you define in the book. Can you talk about that? Sure. We define individuals in three ways. We define individuals as a cooler, a closer, and a cleaner. And actually where I got the concept was when I was in the Olympics with Michael Jordan for the dream team, you know, that you talk about probably the most talented roster on any team sport ever put together. All right. And I'm watching all these guys just practice up and down. And I, I was watching Michael and I had already been affiliated with him for a few years before that. And I'm just watching him. And these are he's among the best of the best. And I'm just like, just there's something different about him. There's just something different. And I just said, so, you know, and the big term in sports is that, you know, that person's a closer. I was like, if you call him a closer, it's you're putting him in a pack that he doesn't belong. He's, there's something in that, in that individual. And then I came up with a term as a cleaner because no matter what you threw at him, all right, he got you that end result over and over again and the job was done spotlessly it was just like mm. it was just done i said so you can't put them in the same category so you know you take an individual a cooler a cooler is an individual they're average at what they do yeah. they're the per people that come in you know you tell them to make 50 say sa uh, sales calls a day they're going to make 50 sales calls not 51 not 52. They're going to do exactly what you do. You tell an individual, hey, I need you to do 15 reps. If they can do 20, they're going to stop at 15 because you told me to do 15. Okay. They're, they're, they're good at what they're good at what they're good at what they're at what they do. All right. Then you have closers. Closers get you that end result as long as a lot of distractions aren't thrown in their direction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you give them a plan, they look at the plan, not very variables are thrown in there. They're going to get you that end result over and over and over again. But when a lot of variables or things don't, when they don't have the playbook in front of them and they, they got to become very instinctive, 
they don't always get they don't always get that end result. They know how to they know how to deal with pressure, but they don't know how to handle pressure. It's a big difference between there's a big difference between between the two. All right. And then you get a cleaner. Well, can you talk about that a little bit? Okay. So you get individuals that from a the difference between dealing and handling, okay. Dealing is you talk yourself into something. You know, I'm going to play this great game. I'm going to play this great game. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get, this didn't happen last time, but this time mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Okay. Handling it is actually getting that end result and showing everybody else. They don't talk, they don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. you, no one ever questions it. No, And that's, that's a main difference between a closer and a cleaner. A cleaner doesn't, a closer never wants the pressure to exceed the pleasure. Okay. A cleaner, the pressure is the pleasure. Mm. They want to be in that pressure. They want to be in that pressure situation. Mm. You know, I tell this story. If you look at um, uh, Michael Jordan, when he, and I use him as, a, as an example because, you know, he's done things numerous times. And I've actually had a, a front row seat, sometimes a, a seat right next to him for many, many years. If you look at the the shot that he made against uh, Cleveland going way back. And, you know, for the younger generation, you can go on YouTube and pull this up. And the whole story behind the thing is Doug Collins was the coach and he drew up this elaborate play because it was the last second play. And he was just like, you know, go over here, go everyone, Scotty, you run here. Michael, you do this, da, da, da. After they break out of the huddle, Michael pulls everybody in. And I know this is PG, so I'll keep it clean. He tells everybody, get the F out the way, give me the ball. Mm -hmm. Give me the ball. That's the di that's that's the difference between somebody who's going to handle the price. Just give me the ball. Yeah, man. You know, <laughs> ah, I love it. So, in talking about somebody like Michael Jordan, for example, or Kobe, or the other folks that you worked with, I know that a lot of people. One of the first things that would just kind of come up is why would they need a coach or why would they need somebody who's going to kind of help them to take their game to the next level? And that's something that I saw clearly in your book is that these are the people who know that there's another level and they're constantly looking for ways to improve. It's amazing. You have your, your smartest individuals, your most successful people in business, you know, whatever it is, sports, you know, philanthropy, whatever it is. All right. They're the ones that are always looking to go to another level. They're always looking to resources. They're always the ones looking to reach out to reach out to I I individuals. All right, they always want to get better because if you take an individual, and again, let's go back to the you know fitness for a little bit. You have an individual that needs to lose you know twenty pounds. Once they get on the program, first five is pretty easy if they stay with the program. Next five is going to be a little bit more difficult. Next three is going to be a little bit more difficult. And then, you know, as it gets on. So if you're at the elite of what you do to show 1% gain, you got to, you, you, you got to really find that edge. You got to mm -hmm. really know, and you got to know what works. You got to know what's works for you. You know, what works for one individual may not work when that may not work for another individual, but these individuals know that the competition is, is chasing them. They, they kind of, it's funny, they live in kind of, in a world of fear. Fear of n not being afraid, but fear of not being the best. That somebody is going to close that gap. You know, every year when they won championships, the first thing my clients would tell me, what's next? I got to get better. You literally just won the championship and they're <laughs> already like, you know, it, it's funny, cleaners are at their lowest after the highest event. So when they win right. championships, they're like, oh, they, they exhale for a little bit. Now they're like, now their mind is already thinking, what do I got to do next? Yeah. What do I got to do here? Because I've gotten a little older. All right, there's another year's passed by. So how do you compete, keep that competitive edge as you get old, as you get older? Because you know, younger guys are coming so what you got to do, you, you start to sharpen your mind a little bit more. And that's as you get older, as your physical gifts go, 
your mental edge has to get better. That is really being relentless. And in your book with the same title, Relentless, you said the statement that in order to have what you really want, you must first be who you really are. What does that mean? Sean, how many people you know out there are living somebody else's life? A lot. A lot. All right. So at some point, I always say this, things happen, you know, we all have struggles. You know, you never know what the next individual is going through. Is through. Everybody in life is going through something that you know nothing about. You know nothing, you know nothing, you know nothing about. So usually when that happens is somebody else comes in and they snatch your identity. Either you gave it to that person or somebody took it. So now you start to live their life. They set up real estate in your head. They got you thinking the way you want, the, uh, the way they want you thinking. You need to go back and take your identity back from that, you take that back from that individual or the person, the individual either took it or you gave it to. Once you realize who you really are, and that's the whole premises about relentless, and we talked about this, relentless doesn't tell you what to do. It gives you permission to be who you really are. We're all born to be competitive. None of us are born here just to be average, all right? We all have the ability to do more. We have the ability to get to the level that we that we want. You know, physically, we all have limitations, but the mind is, it, it's limitless. The knowledge that you can obtain and that you have access to, to become that individual that you, you're meant to be on this, you're meant to be on this planet, but then you start living somebody else's, you start to live the way somebody else uh, lives because you, you start, you learn, you figure out and you stop dealing with adversity and you stop dealing with things that are going to come at you because you're out there, you're always, you're always looking for happiness. How many people are out there always look, you know, if I lost 10 more pounds, I, I, I would be happier. You know, if I was in a better relationship, I would be, I would be happier. If I had more money, I would be happier. Well, you know what? You can have all those things, but instead of having somebody else do that. You know, you don't go out and find happiness. You create it. And how do you create it? Well, you be cre created by becoming the person that you are meant to be. Mm. That's how you, that's how you don't find happiness. You create happiness. And once you can create that happiness, then you start feeling better about yourself. The weight starts coming off. Your mind starts to become more clear. You're able to deal. You're able to deal with more uh, adversity. You know, you have individuals all the time that come up to you when something doesn't go right. What do they do? They put their arm around you and say, "It's going to be okay." That's all you got. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you no, that it's 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 not gonna be okay unless you make it okay. Yeah. All right. And first, and if somebody just says, okay, we're not put on this on this earth for things just to be okay. There's too many people out there that are already settling for okay and average. Yeah. You know, that's not what we're that's not what we're put on this planet for. Everybody on this planet has the ability to do something special. And it's special to what, to you. You know, you have individuals here that run, that are really into, you know, different kind of charitable events. You have people that run unbelie unbelievable, you know, uh, pet rescues or whatever, whatever, whatever it is, whatever is unique, whatever is unique to you. All right. Those aren't not financially aren't, you know, super rewarding, but that's the identity of the person. Right. That's what's unique to those. You know, they are living their life of how they want to live. What somebody else hasn't, uh, somebody else wants them to be. Right, man. I thought that was so powerful because you know, especially during this time when we can get so many. My my mother in law calls them borrowed desires, mm -hmm. right? Especially with social media today. Like if I had that thing when it wasn't even on your radar before. And you you stop listening to that inner guidance system about who you really are and what really makes you happy and brings you fulfillment. It might not be making you know six or seven or eight figures. It might be like you just mentioned, running a nonprofit or uh, doing something and getting that fulfillment from something else. But we have this really misconstrued idea that if I get that thing that everybody else has, then I'll be happy. And like you said, that's like folks taking up real estate in our own minds. So. It's nuts. Yeah, and it's just think if you, you know from what you just said, if you 
we all have instincts. And if you just listen to your instincts, oh, most yeah. of the time they're gonna point you in the right, you know, point you in the right direction. If you just think about it, I mean, it's how simple is it when you're driving, you know, and you'd be like, you know what? Yeah, I, you know this location's on the right, but no, you know I'm going to turn left. And you go, I should have listened. I should have listened oh, to my insight. You should have listened. You listen to your gut. And you know when we talk about closers and cleaners, all right? You know a, a closer, a closer, you know trusts his instincts. Okay, a cleaner's instincts trust them. Mm. Mm. No. And, and there's these, there's these little levels of these, what these 1% can do, but we all have the, we all have the ability. We all have instincts. You, you already know things. A lot of decisions you make in life, a lot of things you do, you already know what the consequences and outcome is going to be, but you still do it anyway. Right. Okay. You still, you still, you still do it anyway. I think there's a lot of questions that come up for folks when they read a book like yours. Like, you know, where do I fit in this spectrum? And I think that there's, because even as you're speaking, like I'm really, really excited and hungry to get better, you know? And at some, you know, looking from the outside in, you might think, oh, this, there's a pinnacle, like you've reached, but it's not, you there, know, it, there's, there's always more. There's always more. You just, you look at your most competitive individuals, you know, um, Kobe went from retiring 20 years of basketball. Now he's be, now he's become relentless and is cleaner in the in the bit in the business world. You know, Michael went from playing his 15 years, then you know he's ownership of a team, running the most uh, successful shoe brand company. I out got him on right yeah, now. Yeah, I noticed. I noticed <laughs> when it first came, first came in. You know, you have or let's take you know Jeff Bezos. Everybody knows who that is. It's the gentleman that you know that Amazon. When he first got, when he first got in, you know, I'm going to sit here, I'm going to deliver packages to people's homes in two weeks. And if he was satisfied, he'd have been out of business. Then he came up and said, you know what? I'm going to do it in a week. Then I'm going to do it in two days. Hmm. Now I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to have these little things flying over people's houses and dropping packages off on the same day. You know what? That's not even good enough. I'm going to have it so you can have it in an hour. You know, it's it's always trying to figure out how to knowing there's going to be bumps in the road, yeah. and once there are bumps in the road, you know you're on the right road, and constantly figure out a way to do things a little bit better, a little bit more, a, a little bit more efficient, a little bit more efficiently. Not afraid to try, not afraid to try through new things, not afraid to be embarrassed if things don't work out. There's not a single individual on this planet that's had 100 success, success at everything that they, they've done. Right. Just having, you, you look at all these individuals, they've had some massive failures, massive, yeah. In your book you write, my goal is to make it so challenging in the gym that everything that happens outside the gym seems easy. What did you mean by that? There was something I actually learned from Michael. Michael practiced so hard that the games were easy. He practiced so hard. And it was funny, there wasn't a, very few practices that Michael and Scotty ever play on the same team because Michael knew Scotty was the one guy because top defensive player along that he would challenge him every single day. So it's, you know, it's being prepared for no matter what is going to be thrown at you, not only physically, but mentally. So you put in the time, you put in the effort, you've put in the research, you know, go back to when, and this is a great lesson for the kids, but even, you know, we had this stuff when we went, uh, when we were in, when we were in school, you had a test, you studied for the test, you'd go to school, you'd be like, no problem. Do you know, maybe a little nervous, you go in, mm. You got a test, you didn't study. Man, I hope it. Hope we get a snow day. Well, out in San Diego, you're not gonna get a snow day, but we're from where both you and I are Midwest, from, yeah. the Midwest. Man, I hope we have a substitute teacher. <laughs> you know, Something. I hope there's a fire alarm that day. You weren't prepared. You weren't, if you weren't prepared, you have to be so well prepared that it makes everything else easy. Go back to the fit, go to back to the fitness thing. And, you know, people always say that, 
you know, working out is uncomfortable. Working out is supposed to be uncomfortable, right? But how uncomfortable is it with type 2 di uh, diabetes? How uncomfortable is it carrying an extra 50 pounds, not only on your heart, but on your joint? How, comfortable I uh, how uncomfortable is it with high cholesterol? How, comfortable, how uncomfortable is it having achy joints? If you really go back and think about it, all right, and you, you, know, you know this better than I do, how many things, both physically and mentally, could you just alleviate by exercising, by eating better, and getting the proper amount of proper amount of sleep? All right. So when you know when it's you the root of almost everything, right? <laughs> so and that, but that, but that's what I'm talking about. Being so well prepared, those individuals that are so well prepared, you don't think so. <laughs> They take their workout seriously. Your your most successful entrepreneurs in business, majority of them, have a very strict regimen of exercising. It's part of their protocol. Yeah. You, you can look at you can you can look it up. All right, they eat well. All right, and they get the proper amount. They get the proper amount of rest. You know, everyone talks. Yeah, they always say, "Oh man, I work eighteen. I I work eighteen hours a day." Yeah, just because. Listen. Just because you put in long hours and hard work, that doesn't guarantee success. Yeah. It's what are you putting the long hours in and knowing when to say, hey, listen, you, you have an individual, you can be effective for a certain amount of time. Yeah, you might be able to do two days in a row where you've done 18 hours, but then when after that, is, is your mind really functioning? Is your right. body really functioning at an optimal level? You, ha you have to recover. You know, Kobe, you said, <laughs> everybody thinks Kobe Bryant, you, you should just take a thousand shots. At, uh, you know, I took a thousand shots. He didn't take a thousand shots every day. Well, he understood that some days, this is what I'm going to do. The next days, uh, I'm, I'm here. These are the individuals, but they always listen. The, you know, you get the one thing, and we talked about this early, well, talked about this earlier. How do things become easier? How do things become easier is when you start to listen to individuals that have expertise in other fields and you put that in action. My first professional client was Michael Jordan. All right. He knew I was never going to play. I've never scored a single point in an NBA game. Now I've scored a basket in every NBA arena when it's empty. I've taken the <laughs> shots up. <laughs> but he knew this individual has an expertise in something that can benefit him. Yeah. And he was willing to listen. And when you're willing to listen, you're willing to adapt, you're willing to overcome, things become easier. They become easier when you expect them, when you stop expecting them to become easier. Awesome, awesome. And this is something else you talk about. We're gonna have fears. They're gonna be there. You're gonna feel nervous. But I think you mentioned to Michael one time because he talks about even him being nervous in four big games. And you mentioned something about getting the butterflies moving in one direction. Yeah, it's funny. You know, everyone says, man, I, you know, and being nervous is a part of life, all right? It, it, it happens. It's something that, you know, it's it's an instinctive thing. So a lot of people can't control it. They say, man, I always have this thing, you know, man, I got butterflies in this, my stomach. Mm -hmm. I said, that's great. You got butterflies. So make sure they're all going in the same direction. That's right. You know, you control which way you want the butterflies to go. It's just like your thought process. If you if you got thoughts in here and you got them bouncing around all over the place, it, you don't have clarity up here. You don't have clarity. All right. You you have to get whatever direction you choose to go in. All right. You have to have clarity about that. You have to have clarity about that direction. And once you have clarity about that direction and the and from a physical standpoint and from a um mental standpoint. You know, people always say, I want to move forward. Yeah. Okay. If you move it, great. You want to move forward, but you want to move forward and upward. You just don't want to move forward. All right. If you're only moving forward, you're following the pack. The, the, the idea is to get away from the pack. The idea is to separate yourself from individuals. The idea is to separate yourself from the pack. The more you, the better you do for yourself. And and this is where society's a little bit off. I disagree with this. You know, everyone always says you need to help other individuals. You need to be available for this. I agree with that 100%, but not at the stake of not taking care of yourself. Because if you can take care of yourself, that allows you to do more for yourself and allows you to do more for others. 
again, there's so many things I want to ask you about, but having having this in front of us, this opportunity to get better, to improve, we're also going to fail. And all of these incredible athletes that you've worked with over the years, they failed numerous times, but they don't see failure in the same way that the average person does. So can you talk a little bit about that, what you've seen consistently with them? Failure is a failure is a learning, failure is a learning pro failure is a learning process. All right. It's never failure. It's only failure if you don't learn from it. If you learn from it, it's not I don't you can never consider it failure. All right. So that's how you, that's how you gotta kind of look, you gotta kind of look at it. Uh, these individuals that everybody's going to fail it. So you're not going to hit every game when you're not going to hit every game when it's shot. You're not going to throw the perfect, uh, you're not going to throw the perfect pass for the touchdown every, every single time. But are you willing to learn from that process? You know, I have people always say, I love how this, uh, they, they say this all the time. You know, you learn more from losing than you do from winning. Hmm. The, your top of the top people learn just as much from winning as they do from losing. They, it's a constant learning process. Mm -hmm. And if you have a constant learning process, are you really failing? Okay. You only fail when the learning process stops. And if you decide you failed at something, you figure out a different way to get that end result. But as long as you continue to constantly learn and don't let that failure beat you up, you know, there's people that are constantly it's something that they failed at way many many years ago, and, and they 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 just it, it's kind of just continues to eat at them over and over and over again. Well, you need to either you, you're never going to forget about it, but you can't constantly think about it. You know, the greats, the greats, they 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 remember their failures. You know, they they could tell you to the detail. You know, you talk right. to your greatest entrepreneurs, you right. tell them, they'll tell you every business idea that didn't work well, every stock that they bought that didn't, that didn't go. And what do they do? They just, they use it as a learning thing and they laugh at it. Did they forget about it? No, but they don't constantly think about it. People that don't know how to use failure, they're constantly thinking about that, fi that failure moment. Yeah. And when you're constantly thinking about the failure moment, you're not in the moment. Your greatest athletes, and your greatest business people, and I say this all the time, thinking to them is a distraction. Because if you're thinking, you're not in the moment. You're in order to be in that 1%, or I, not even that 1%, that point oh oh one percent the zone is not about thinking. The zone is about clarity. It's about being able to let your instincts do everything that they're meant to do. It's not thinking about, it's not thinking about the failures. It's you're in the moment. How many times can you talk to an individual that they can tell you, I'm in the moment? Not many. Yeah, not today. Yeah, not today. Not with all the distractions. This all ties back to what we talked about earlier. It's with the distractions. You get distracted so easily, you're never, you're never in the moment. And I'm not talking about just, I'm just talking, not talking about, you know, work. I'm talking about when you're with your family, when you're with your yeah. kids, when you, you know, whatever you're doing, be in that moment. Because if you're not in that moment, you're going to miss that moment. And sometimes you don't get that missed opportunity or that missed moment back. That's a failure. There's a difference between being average and being great. You know, there's a difference between being average and being phenomenal. And so I want to know for you, what can people do and what did you do to take yourself from, you know, I'm pretty good at this to being world class? Like, what does it take to do that? Yeah, I think for me, it's, you know, it's three components. I think the first one is you, you want to get your credit up in whatever you're doing. You know what I'm saying? I think, Sean, if you and I both sat here and talked about health, um, you'd blow me out the water. You know what I'm saying? And not just the information, but you've been doing it in terms of the physical, working out for years. You also had an ailment that, you know, that you studied and was like, I got to get through this. You know, you, you, you actually helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people do it. So there's a credibility that you have because you, you've become one with, the, with, with what you're doing. Whereas somebody who read a book and then say it, it's like, ah, that's good information, but some kind of way it's not coming across the right way. So I think the first thing you need to do is like literally live what you're talking about. And I, and I, I think a lot of people, 
You know, like I hear people shine, you know, how to make a million dollars. I'm like, bro, you, you in debt. You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you mean how to make a million dollars? Like, what does that mean? Like, you, you're making that up. You don't really believe that, you know, or you haven't lived it. So I think one, you know, the lived experience is always the best one. Number two, I did it every day, every single day. You know, I was either teaching a GD class or I was going to the hospitals and speaking, you know, just whatever, not necessarily in front of people, but my, like I said, my GD class, you know, church, I would get an opportunity, you know, go speak to elementary school, you know, go and serve at a, um, you know, at a shelter and not necessarily in front of everybody, but I'm one on one with this person and I'm perfecting, you know, my skill. And then the last one, which I think is the biggest challenge. People do what they do outside of the people they're doing it for. You know, it's the weirdest thing. It's like people self acclaim like I'm a great speaker. Who told you you were great? Like, was, was it the people that you were talking to? Did they tell you were great? Or did just, you just make up in your own mind you're great? And so I spent a lot of time, what do the people want to hear? What are, they, what are their challenges? What are they going through? So when you see me at a Michigan State still, you know, when you still see me at, the, at, a, at, a, as a, at a prison or, you know, at a shelter, I'm doing that because I need to be, I need to know the pulse of the people that I'm talking to. And there are a lot of people, they, they get... They, like they do it shine outside of the people that they're doing it for. And that's one of the things I appreciate about you when I was talking to you about, you know, my wife's health. You know, it was a, okay, E, let's talk about what, like, not some just R-E-M-S. It's like, oh, okay, what's your wife, what she, what's Didi going through right now? What is she experiencing? You know, because there'll be people who talk to me about MS and I'm like, yo, my wife not in a wheelchair. You know what I'm saying? Like you talking to me like my wife, like, and, and I know people who are, but like, you're talking to me like my wife was in a wheelchair. Like, you, 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 you have not gotten to know my wife yet. So you're giving me some information, not based on what she's really going through right now. So we need to talk about what, and I just think a lot of people, when they do their work, Sean, they don't care about the people that they're actually working for. They're so consumed with the work itself and speaking that it's like, yo, it's so easy for me to do what I do because I spend 30, 40 hours with people and then when I talk, I only talk about what they told me they wanted to hear. You know, so I think if you do those three things, that's going to help you to get to that next level. People have to understand, I think we all have something that we're good at and, and we need to work at it. But there's some things, let's just be honest, that may be natural for you. So um, speaking is natural for me. Speaking the King's English, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? And then understanding the culture that we live in, because I think a lot of it is cultural. Like somebody might say they're dumb. You're not dumb. If you were in another culture, a culture that was an art culture, and you were in the art, you blow up, you just live in America. And it's, that certain things, and, and culturally, and the timing that we're in, art was something, I remember coming up as a kid, art was like phenomenal. Like you can spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on a piece of art. I don't know with technology now, because people have photoshops and things of that nature, art is not what it was, you know what I'm saying, 30 years ago. So I realized, yo, E, you got a gift, but culturally, you are a part of the minority. You're not a part of the majority. So if you're going to dominate in the speaking arena, then everything you've learned from Detroit, that's not majority, that's minority. So you're gonna have to go to college now to understand majority because you're competing against, you know what I'm saying? Like the individual you're competing against, they don't come from Detroit. They don't use that slang or that language. So you have to become a lot more linear in your thinking. And I'll never be, you know what I'm saying? I'll never be what some people are, but I knew you need a master's and a PhD so that you have a clear understanding of the game. You feel me? Like you, you right now, ET, you on, and no disrespect, you might be like and one basketball. You might be like Globe try to basketball. You know what I'm saying? You need to get NBA. Then after NBA, Sean, European, because European basketball is on a whole nother level in terms of fundamentals. And so I had a gift, but I was like in the culture. I don't have the skills or the tools to be able to dominate in this industry. So I need to go to school because I, by getting a master's and a PhD, and you'll see none of them hanging on my wall, which is nothing wrong with if a person accomplished them, but I wasn't doing it for that. I needed to know the language. So every master's class, I was picking up the language, the codes, the rules. You know what I'm saying? Like I was picking up, how do you tell stories? You know, when do you start and when do you stop? Because what you do at a church is not what you do for corporate America. 
And if I'm going to dominate in corporate America, I need to understand the language. So for me, every teacher for me was giving away, they were giving away the clues. Every presentation they were put together, I'm like, they go to clues. Like, this is what I need to do. You know, I need to make a statement and then I need to have empirical evidence. I need to have data to back that up. You feel what I'm saying? And so you can do the uh, passion boy, but the passion is not going to make you the money you want to make. It's not going to give you the influence you need. So for me, school was, yo, I need to go pick up the patterns. I need to learn the patterns of this culture and for this time. And I went and did that and made it happen. So that's why I'm saying like for each person, you have to be careful. What are you going to school for? What are your goals? So it was easy to, not easy, meaning the, the coursework, but the why was, 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 was given when I realized, yo, I'm going to blow this company up if I go get this PhD and learn all of this stuff. If I don't, even my staff, are, they're going to be limited to me you know, and one. You look at a LeBron, he can go anywhere he wants right now. You know what I'm saying? He can go to any team. Once his contract is over, he can play for anybody. But there's another guy playing. He can't go, let's just say maybe a Carmelo, who's a good player, but he can't necessarily go to any team he wants to go to. And I was like, I will do, I will, I will not serve my company well if I'm limited in any way. So this PhD is gonna put me in a position where, man, we'll be able to dominate the industry. One of the things, Sean, that I'm going to really teach people this year, you know, you and I have talked about Didi, you know, and MS and just the brain and what you need to do, you know, in terms of saturated fats and, you know, things you need to do for the brain, things, you know, that you need to eat to stimulate the brain and just really bring that health to the brain. Because a lot of people, like you said, they always think it's the, the gut, you know, et cetera, like building your chest out. But you're like, yo, that brain is our I think, Sean, uh, when you look at uh, birth, um, you look at animals are born with fangs right off the cuff to protect themselves. You look at claws. Humans, no human is born with that. And let's just be honest, the average human doesn't really get to the point of strength, strength till they really in their late teens. Like you're not five years old bench pressing 150. So what is the thing that God has given us to protect ourselves? It's the brain to me. It's the brain. Like it's the, that's the one thing we have that, that other creatures don't have that allows us to, 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 to really, you know, be progressive. And so what I'm going to teach, as you were talking about Didi and her brain with MS and some of the things she can do to get healthy, you know, bro, I'm taking it back to the imagination. Like, we, Sean, ain't nobody on that no more. Nobody's talking about the brain and what the brain can actually do. You know, like when you talk about meditation, a lot of people just hear from, oh, I'm going to meditate to rest, to rejuvenate. No, no, no. I want you to learn how to use the brain to create things that don't even exist because that's the power we have. When you look at Walt Disney, like Walt Disney was teaching us, like, yo, the brain, you look at Disney World, like he had people coming from France and Germany, and Italy, and Africa, Spain, all over the world to come to Disney World. And when you finish in Disney World, you're like, what in the world? And while we have a lot of things, there's not a lot of things that have topped Disneyland and Disney World. So one of the things I'm going to teach this year is like, yo, you can use your brain to fix some of the problems that you have in your life. You can use your brain to fix your marriage. You can use your brain to fix your relationship. You can use your brain to get a bigger house. I'll never forget when I told people I was moving to Cali. How you want to have a house in a church here? And you're not using your brain. Like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm not going to be the only person that has properties all over the place. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I won't be the first. But if you're not using your imagination, you can surely, you can't do that. So one of the things, man, I want to teach this year is you have one of the most powerful tools. Yeah, the computer's great. Yo, your cell phone is great. But man, your mind is a, it could get you from being homeless in a high school dropout to where I am right now. So we're going to do some brain training this year. Yeah, yeah. We're going to do some brain training. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. Mindfulness as I study it has nothing to do with meditation. Meditation is fine, it's just different. It's the simple process of noticing. And when you're noticing, the neurons are firing and 45 years of research shows that it's literally and figuratively enlivening.